Atheist Nomads episode 110. News for September 3, 2015. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo haws. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. And my lovely wife, Lauren, is not with us. Uh, She is uh, ill. Ooh. Yeah. I'll bet she's pregnant. Fuck you. (laughs) Every uh, time a woman vomits, everybody thinks, oh, she must be pregnant. That's right. And I was starting to think, oh, that's just really, really sexist. And then all of a sudden it was like, wait a minute. Every time a man vomits, everybody assumes he's hungover. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Yeah. When a all more right, appropriate well, response to Spray. vomiting is, oh, are you okay? Because whether you're sick, hungover, or pregnant... You might need help if you're vomiting. You know what? Fuck that. I'm going to start switching this shit up. Anytime a woman's preg- uh, like pukes and shit, I'm just saying, hey, did, are you fucking hungover? What the hell? Man pukes? I'm like, hey, dude, get a pee stick. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn. Yeah. Oh, boy. Hey, guess what? What? I got a scooter. Nice. And it's is it still running? Yeah, again yeah, it, it's running like a top awesome uh, yeah i took my uh motorcycle basic riders course <laughs> yeah, on a on a proper motorcycle uh suzuki gz250 i think it was but uh yeah anyways uh now i have a 2014 uh stella 125 auto um uh, it's like a vespa clone actually the company used to make well, and still does have like permission to make Vespas essentially, and nice. they just make upgrades for them as they go. But yeah, it's pretty fucking fun. I'm giving zero fucks about what people think, and it's just a blast to ride. Awesome. Yeah. Oh. Um. Oh yeah. And the the whole not running thing. Uh, <laughs> the fucking plug wire came detached from the the actual cap that goes on top of the spark plug. So I. <laughs> screwed the yeah I, I mean like i could swear i heard arcing inside the engine compartment when i when i turn it over and uh yeah open up the compartment and fucking saw an inch long spark when i turn it over so oh I was wow like, uh, yeah that shouldn't be there oh huh. so got the wire started looking around and yeah i put it back in the plug cap and started right up oh huh. yeah i i recently uh Completely changing the topic, uh, discovered <laughs> that I am allergic to bitter hops. Right. So your so, beer selection's even smaller now. Well, I, I generally didn't like beers with the bitter hops. Like, I, I don't, I don't have never liked IPAs. But that doesn't mean that you know they can't sp- spike some of their beers with them. But pale ales make me sneeze. Yeah. Okay. And old Rasputin Imperial. Uh, stout. Stout, yeah, yeah. Delicious beer. My mother-in-law had a couple for me. After the first one, I had to blow my nose, and after the sec- or, and during the second, I had to wipe my nose almost continuously, and I had to blow it three times. Right. Yeah. So, sneezy, or you start running? Huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, right now, I'm drinking not your father's root beer. <laughs> All right. This is a, uh, uh, it's from Small Town Brewery in Wisconsin, 5.9% alcohol, yeah. and it tastes kind of like, well, about like dad's root beer. 
I don't know. Uh, dads is all right. I'm, I'm not, I don't like hires. I don't like the mug. Dads is all right. Give me barks. I like that. Oh yeah. Bite, bite to it. Well, I, this does have a bite to it. So okay. somewhere in between dads and barks, I'd say. All right. All right. With some, you know, a little bit of alcohol in it in there. <laughs> yeah. I've heard of some, uh, alcoholic root beers and they sound very interesting. I'd really like to try. It's delicious. Uh, this one has finally made it to Boise. Like it's everywhere. Uh, every store has it now. And you know, who knows? It might make it up your way here in a little bit. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and move into our special topic. Um, I am underprepared. Uh, the, the reason being that I been taking care of your pregnant wife. She's not pregnant. <laughs> I've been taking care of my car. Uh, Fair enough. The all alignment right. was off, and I had to get all four tires replaced. Oh, shit. Not yesterday. just rotated? Not just rotated. No, the shoulders uh. were gone. Uh, we went for a drive Sunday and uh, pulled off into Idaho City. That's actually where Lauren picked up the Not Your Father's Root Beer mm -hmm. and pulled off the highway and heard a weird noise coming from the front left and it's like um that's not good <laughs> right. and by the time i figured out well i noticed that the shoulder was quite worn pulled it off and it was down to threads damn so i put the spare on uh, after i got home discovered that the right rear also had the inner shoulder gone front left right rear uh that would suggest that the alignment was off prior to the last rotation and the guy who did the rotation didn't notice that the um, alignment was fucked fuck so i went back to that shop to see if they'd make it right yeah. and the manager was being a dick so i went back to les schwab and mm. 450 dollars later right got perfect alignment and four brand new tires man I was expecting 800. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, better. Yeah. So I was happy. <laughs> anyway, so that took up a lot of a fuck ton of time to deal with all that. Anyway, so um the the topic today is is the end. The end is coming. Not the end of the podcast. This episode is just beginning and the end is not in sight for the show as a whole. We're talking about the end of days. Mm. Uh, we're just going to be starting a little series on apocalyptic bullshit and with a, a little emphasis on uh, Adventist apocalyptic stuff because it's unique. Yeah, it's kind of your specialty too. Interesting. And yes, my specialty. Uh, but we, we need to have a general overview. Um, people have, Christians have believed that the end was near as long as there have been Christians. Yeah. Uh, if you read the Gospels, Jesus is the alleged Jesus is alleged to have said that one of the people there would still be alive when he returned. Right. The whole wandering Jew thing. Paul advised Christians to not bother getting married because there wasn't enough time. Jesus was coming any day. Would I be wrong in calling Christianity a death cult? No. Okay. No, it is an apocalyptic death cult. Yay. They worship a dead guy. They are focused on death and a horrible, horrible apocalypse. Um, but throughout the, the rest of, of, you know, time since then, um, Christians have always thought the end was near. They've always thought that Jesus was coming. Uh, very well-documented examples include Martin Luther, 500 years ago, believing that Jesus would come in his lifetime. Hmm. Uh, the Adventist church has its its background in William Miller. And we'll get more into him later, but he believed that Jesus would return on October 22, 1844. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have been pretty keen on setting dates. The Branch Davidians have been very keen on setting dates. The high school I went to, Milo Adventist Academy, was built in the 1950s, and they were sure that Jesus would come within a decade. So while I was there, they were midway through rebuilding the entire campus. <laughs> they didn't build it to last. Why bother? Jesus is coming. <laughs> and when you're, you're in an apocalyptic death cult, when you believe, like every Christian for the last 2,000 years, that Jesus is coming in your lifetime, you're always looking at events to see what 
here might tie in with prophecy. Uh, William Miller was looking at events with wars in Europe. I, as a young Christian, was looking at the September 11 attacks. Mm -hmm. There was a, a passage from one of Ellen White's books where she was describing that in the end of days, uh, the skyscrapers in New York would come down. And that's the founder of it. Oh, seven day, right? Uh, one of them, yeah. Okay. The the church's early prophet, and we'll we'll get more into her in in a couple episodes. Uh, but yeah, she had a vision that the skyscrapers in New York would burn to the ground. Uh, there was I, I looked at the fact that commercial aviation, civil aviation, was grounded for a week, and using the day to a year principle, which we will also cover here shortly. Um, calculated that out to 30 minutes in prophetic time. And there is a, a prophecy in Revelation uh, with heaven being silent for a half hour. And the heavens were silent for a half hour in prophetic time or a week in real time when there were no, no planes flying overhead. And I was at, at my church's, my school's uh, apocalyptic survival course, senior survival when the September 11 attacks happened. And Fuck. that part of Southern Oregon is right under the major north-south uh, air path, flight path. And so the first two days of, of senior survival, we got up there Sunday, all day Sunday, all day Monday, and early Tuesday morning, you'd look up and you would always see a contrail. You would hear planes every half hour or so. And then the skies were quiet. <laughs> so it was easy to try to tie that in with, with prophecies to, to try to say, yes, yes, Jesus is coming soon. Of course, when Christians have been believing since the beginning of Christianity, that Jesus is coming soon and he hasn't, he's quite late. He's late for the early Adventists. He's late for Martin Luther. He's awfully late for Paul and John, and anybody who thought that Jesus would come in their lifetime, that they wouldn't die, which kind of makes you wonder when you've got a belief like that, the end is, is nigh, how long can people keep thinking, oh, it's just going to be a little bit longer? <laughs> God damn. I don't know, the whole nine eleven thing, I mean, honestly, it, it's it's so stupid easy to see what you want to see when there's a traumatic event going on yeah oh and that event actually worked out so perfectly that the pastor that was leading uh the the spiritual survival courses mm -hmm. uh since the the day was broken up into spiritual survival uh wild edibles and just general wilderness survival stuff and of course team building activities as well and a decent amount of skinny dipping and streaking <laughs> Uh, yeah. We might have been good Adventists, but we were still teenagers. Teenagers in the wilderness. And uh, anyway, so uh, we had one classmate who was, he'd been to, gone to Texas for a wedding that weekend. And yeah. so he was just finally flying back. And the principal brought him up, pulled uh, the pastor over to him, whispered something in his ear. We all just sat there wondering. Uh, we'd just been reading from Ellen White's The Great Controversy about how easily people will be deceived in the end days. <laughs> oh no. And then he presented the events of that day as a what if. What if somebody said this happened? And we were like, yeah, it'd be bullshit. Uh, we wouldn't believe it. <laughs> bullshit. And then he said, it happened. And he repeated it. And about half the class didn't believe. <laughs> and the principal had to come up and say, yes, this actually happened. A fair number of us still didn't believe it. Thought it was just some some ploy to make the point. Yeah. And I was one of the, the final like five holdouts. <laughs> I heard uh, Gordon Smith on the radio. He was a senator from Oregon at the time. And uh, he was talking about the dastardly deed. and Like, oh crap, this happened. <laughs> one classmate waited until he heard, heard it from President Bush. He yelled out like a whole nother hour. Since, of course, Bush had to get done um, reading stories to children yeah, before damn. he could <laughs> even get to the briefing. And so it, 
Yeah, it went. It was what's interesting is those of us who had a hard time buying it that needed external uh, confirmation. Yeah. We're all atheists now. Oh, nice. All of us. Man, that's that's actually kind of cool. Uh, how, many, how many or like you said, the last five of you, essentially? There's about five. Uh, but my class is 65. Realistically, 30 of us are probably atheists now. God damn. Or at least at least 15 or 20. Uh, realistically, only 30 would still be in the church, if even that many. Adventists do a very poor job, like the rest of Christians, at holding youth. Yeah, but you're you're thinking at least a third of them are are atheists now, atheists or just are pretty damn or just close. not church attending. Uh, I would say actively at least not Christian, huh. if not fully atheist. All right, not bad. Yeah, give them, an, give them another fifty years. <laughs> <laughs> well, one problem is the Adventist Church is. One of the few that is actually still growing in the U.S. They do a lot of evangelism. They draw a lot of people from other Christian denominations. Yeah, and they're they're really time bombed. I mean, they're very prophetic in their dates, and you know, they a date doesn't happen, and you have the great disappointment. And Adventists haven't done dates since the great disappointment. Okay, huh? The JWs and Branch Davidians have, and a few other groups, but. The Seventh Adventist Church hasn't. They've been uh, very. If if anybody tries to claim a date, they are very uh, quick to denounce that person. <laughs> like fuck it, this shit burned us once. Mm-hmm. Okay. Huh. I'll be down. All right. You ready for history? <laughs> oh, I suppose. <laughs> the stand history, September third. 1783 the treaty of paris is signed uh so yeah this isn't some little weird frenchy thing uh no it's actually uh the treaty of paris was signed by representatives of king george the third of great britain and representatives of the united states of america uh it actually ended the american revolutionary war hooray uh this treaty along with separate other uh, peace treaties between Great Britain and the nations that supported you know, us great Americans, like uh, France, Spain, uh, the Dutch Republic, uh, are all collectively known as the Peace of Paris. And interestingly, the territorial provisions were exceedingly generous to the United States uh, mm -hmm. in terms of like enlarged boundaries. Yeah, claiming everything to the, the West that Britain had control of. No, even better. I mean, we almost got uh, the territory of Quebec out of Canada. <laughs> well, the uh, colonial army, or excuse me, the continental army had actually occupied Quebec yeah. for a year. Their uh, former headquarters building is actually still flying the 13-star uh, flag. Nice. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. in, uh, in Montreal. So let's see. Uh, representing the United States uh, was uh, Ben Franklin, John Jay, Henry Lawrence, and John Adams. Uh, uh, let's see. I forget the David Hartley and Richard Oswald represented Great Britain. And yeah, they did some, some damn good work there. So hooray. And just a little tidbit here. This day in history, 1812, the Pigeon Roost Massacre. So, uh, yeah, you might have heard about a little thing called the War of 1812, which uh, kind of pissed off a lot of people, especially uh, Native Americans, uh, formerly called Indians. Yes, uh, actually, specifically, mostly from the Shawnee tribe. Um, they sent a war party. Uh, which uh, had a surprise attack on a village, and they actually coordinated the attacks on uh, there and uh, Fort Harrison, which is near uh, Terry Hout, and Fort Wayne. So it turns out that uh, 24 settlers, including 15 children, were massacred. Uh, two kids were kidnapped, and 
Out of all that carnage, only four of the uh, Shawnee attackers were killed. Hmm. <laughs> so uh, a little bit of a location here for you. Just a uh, Pigeon Roo State Historic Site is uh, located between Scottsburg and Henryville, Indiana, which is near Underwood, Indiana. Yeah. Weird. Yeah, it's... Uh... <laughs> They had a lot to lose with the the War of eighteen twelve. Well, you can't really blame them. And mm. not only that, but it was a good opportunity to try to reclaim their land. Yeah, it didn't really work. But yeah, good try. Yeah, the U.S. was busy trying to fight with Britain and <laughs> hoping to take Canada. And a lot of native tribes were left in the middle to get fucked over. Yeah. Yeah, basically with anything in American history, you can guarantee the natives lost. Well, pretty much if you're not white, you lost. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so moving on along. This day in history, the year was 1914, and Dixie Lee Ray was born. You're saying, who the fuck is she? Well, uh, <laughs> yes, Dixie is a lady. Um, well, Dixie was a scientist who served as the 17th and first female governor of the state of Washington. She was variously described as idiosyncratic and ridiculously smart. Uh, she was known for her leadership of the state during the devastating eruption of Mount St. Helens, which was fucking amazingly terrible and mount st helen's actually even got ash like a, a good dust covering at my aunt's house in the middle of wyoming you know oh it's like i don't know driving is like 1100 miles yeah i think it's a fair piece yeah wow yeah but uh yeah she she was definitely a democrat uh, even, uh, she was a very big supporter of, uh, nuclear energy and, uh, getting trade going, but, uh, man, man, oh man, she even allowed, uh, super tankers to dock in the Puget Sound and yeah, just, uh, very smartly, but, um, not something you'd really recognize as a Democrat anymore. PhD in marine biology from Stanford. Yeah. She served as chair of the Atomic Energy Commission under Nixon, assistant no secretary slouch. of state for oceans and international environmental and scientific affairs under Ford, and then governor. God damn. Yeah. <laughs> One brainy lady. I find it uh, very chuckle worthy that uh, at the age of 16, she legally changed her name from Margaret Ray to Dixie Lee in homage to uh robert e lee mm. <laughs> well and then of course looking at this uh wikipedia article i had to click the link on sexual orientation <laughs> I, I, I mean she doesn't I, she I never said anything <laughs> carefully avoided it in public dis uh, discussion uh lesbian was never used to describe her but there was a lot of rumors based on her tomboy characteristics and unmarried status. I find it slightly troubling, slightly hilarious that there is actually a, a heading of sort sexual orientation on which. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, if that's, if, if she was running for candidacy right now, that shit would be smeared everywhere. Mm hmm. I mean, oh, yeah. not, not if she was running against Bernie, but you know, everybody else it would be. I like Bernie. Vote for Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. But uh, yeah, she died a few years later, I think in 1994, was it? Mm hmm. Moving a few years along. This day in history, 1991. The uh, famed director, Frank. Capra dies. Oh boy, Frank. So, yeah, mo most everybody knows this guy for one reason or another. 
Uh, but uh, Frank Capper became one of America's most influential directors during the 1930s. And he, uh, he won three Oscars uh, for best picture for best director, excuse me. Uh, along his leading films was It Happened One Night, uh, which became the first film to win all five top Oscars. Uh, other leading films in his prime included You Can't Take It With You, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which there might be a few people know that one. I, I'm familiar with it, but I haven't seen it, unfortunately. Uh, ditto. I'm going to have to watch that. I've yeah. heard good things, even though it's very, I'm sure... I don't know. Old school. Well, old school, but overly idealistic, perhaps simplistic. Oh, probably. But, yeah. But, you know, that was the time. Uh, during World War II, it, uh, which is the more interesting part, uh, Capra served in the United States Army Signal Corps and produced propaganda films such as the Why We Fight series. <laughs> That's what I find interesting. Yeah. Uh, Why We Fight was seven different films, which uh, he he made most of them. And they were all distributed to the United States uh, troops first, but later released to the public in a attempt to rile us up into fighting the Nazis and the Japanese during World War II to kind mm -hmm. of suck our country into fighting. Mm hmm. And they were wildly successful. Man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of scary. <laughs> but let's see. Um, Capra drew a lot of his uh, inspiration. He was uh, very daunted yet impressed uh, by this another uh, director named uh, Lenny Reifstahl. Uh, I'm sure I nailed that. A very old... Um, German propaganda filmmaker who made the, the film triumph of the will. Uh, and they kind of, uh, he kind of drew inspiration from this guy on how to basically take all of their, the, uh, Germans propaganda films and other propaganda films and turn them against the, uh, them. Oh, so, so it's kind of, kind of weird, kind of interesting. <laughs> Yeah, uh, shortly after Capra's meeting with General Marshall, uh, he viewed Lenny Reifstahl's uh, tearing, terrifying motion picture, you know, that's mentioned The Triumph of Will, and uh, Capra described the film as the ominous prelude to Hitler's Holocaust of Hate. Satan couldn't have devised a more blood-chilling super spectacle. <laughs> mm. Wow. Uh, though panoplied with all the pomp and mystical trappings of a Wagnerian opera, its message was a, as blunt and brutal as a lead pipe. We, the Heinvolk, are the new invincible gods. Uh, that's a hell of a quote. But uh, according to Capra, Triumph of the Will fired no guns, dropped no bombs, but as a psychological weapon aimed at destroying the will to resist, it was just as lethal. <laughs> Man. Yeah, uh, the dude grudgingly respected the shit out of that uh, German director. But, uh, man, oh, man. Wow. Kind of weird, kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, uh, yeah, getting back to his, his films that everybody knows. Uh, after World War II, Capra's career declined a lot, and his later films, like the one that most people know, it's a Wonderful Life, uh, where at the time, critically uh, derided as being, well, simplistic and overly idealistic. But uh, pretty much every Christmas time, people seem to love it a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. Yeah, that's where that came from. Anyways, yeah, 1901. 1991. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, and his uh, buddy Jimmy Stewart, who starred in a lot of his films, uh, also served in World War II. Uh, although, rather than making films, he flew bombers. Yeah, he was actually in the war. <laughs> yeah. 
And for his retirement as a colonel from the Air Force, he actually flew one bombing run in the Vietnam War. Weird. I don't even know what the fuck to say to that. Jimmy Stewart, what the hell? That's weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little weird. <laughs> that was like his goodbye present? Yeah, yeah, something like, like that. I'm going to go bomb some brown people. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Ready for science? Sure. Uh, sure. <laughs> all right. We'll be back after a quick break with science. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. Tweet us at atheistnomads. Send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541 203 Zero six six six. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. For the first time ever, there are three Category 4 hurricanes in the Pacific Ocean at the same time. To make it worse, they're all lined up around Hawaii. <laughs> like, literally, if you look at the satellite imagery and you draw a line across them, it goes right across the southern tip of the big island of Hawaii where one of my brothers now lives. Not troubling at all. I don't know if he's on the big island, but I don't think he's on the big island. I think he's on Oahu. Um, but yeah, he's in Hawaii. To put this in context, there hasn't even ever been three category three hurricanes at the same time. So this is not only setting a new record, it's blowing the last record way out of the water. <laughs> and these hurricanes threaten, well, Hawaii, Japan, the Philippines, and Taiwan. And these are all linked to the stronger-than-usual El Nino event that is currently in the Eastern Pacific. And sadly, thanks to climate change, this is something we should get used to. Hmm. This is going to be the new normal. Crazy fire seasons, like we have right now, are going to be the new normal. Climate change has real effects now. We have an island nation in the Indian Ocean looking for new land so they can leave before they don't have land. We've got Miami Beach wanting to secede from Florida because the state isn't doing anything while they are routinely flooding with sewage literally backing up. And <laughs> storm surges in Florida are also contaminating drinking water across the state. Uh, we've got villages in Alaska that are Three villages right now that are having to move inland because there's too much erosion. They are, the permafrost is getting too thin and they're getting too much flooding when big storms, the remnants of big typhoons come up and soak them. Which Florida town is wants to secede from Florida? Miami Beach. Well, when you got a, a giant dickhead like Rick Scott as a governor that doesn't uh -huh. want to even have like climate change mentioned you know i can't really blame them yeah and it sucks <laughs> for sure <laughs> um but yeah life is gonna get worse uh and, and unfortunately the people are gonna be the most affected by this it's not people living in the mainland u.s yeah a few few people might have to move when they run out of water in california but it's not like islands that are going to get washed off the face of the earth. It's not like villages that are sinking or eroding away. It's, it's bad. And those fuckers in Washington, D.C. need to do something. Uh, it's, it's too late to stop what's already happening, but we could at least keep it from getting worse. Yeah, Obama just went to Alaska in the last uh -huh. few days. And he he basically renamed Mount McKinley to Mount uh, Denali, which the natives ar around there have been trying to do for decades, and a lot of other people. Alaska uh, has been calling it Denali forever. That's the way I understand it. The the even the, white Alaskans call it Denali. <laughs> uh, the giant national forest and park that's around there is called uh, Denali National Forest, as I recall, even. Park. Park. Thank you. National Park. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he's he's doing that to try and, well, 
because he should want for one but he's also on a big uh, climate change push and then you got assholes like Bo- uh governor bobby jindal of that uh missouri or mississippi louisiana louisiana fuck uh yeah, bobby jindal that uh is sending obama letters saying you shouldn't talk about climate change essentially mm-hmm. yeah, like come on i mean i'm very glad that this is getting like public attention but man yeah well and getting back on the the, the whole name change thing mm. uh, i am this isn't gonna be the most politically correct thing to say okay but my take on it is whatever the locals predominantly call it is what it should be called so i don't know why that's not politically correct well like i saw an article with uh that was suggesting that mount rainier and saint helens should be renamed to the names that the natives had given them if the common usage in the local area around them changes to that then i would be in favor of doing that i would be too sure but as long as the locals are happy calling it what they call it you know that's that's fine to keep calling it that mount denali everybody in alaska has been calling it denali it's not a pro-native thing it's not an anti-white thing it's the right thing (laughs) it's like when people try to put a z in boise (laughs) call it what the fucking locals call it (laughs) now it does get a bit extreme with places like warshire massachusetts which loses like most of its name the way they pronounce it but hey if they want to call it warsher or worse or whatever we should call it that in case you didn't know though uh you know like i say in president barack obama re- is renaming mount Ken- uh, mckinley to denali uh just so you know though denali is the kenyan word for black power <laughs> just putting that out there right 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 which is why it's been on every map and globe <laughs> either as the main name or in parentheses forever yeah <laughs> yeah all righty then moving along a fragment of the quran stored at a library in birmingham england has been carbon dated by scientists at oxford and this carbon dating dates the parchment to between 568 and 645 ce Muhammad, on the other hand, is believed to have lived from 570 to 632. That's putting it to around the same time as Muhammad, if not a little bit earlier. Mm. And this would be equivalent to gospel sayings being dated to, say, 10 BCE to 40 CE. And now, according to Muslim scholars, the Quran was compiled starting in 653 after the death of Muhammad and had been retained in oral tradition and a handful of fragments. But this dating of this fragment actually suggests instead that some of the sayings attributed to, attributed to Muhammad may have already been written before his time. Uh, okay, well, that, that is pretty damn funny. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, <sighs> Muhammad is actually able to be fairly fair, fairly able to to say that he was a real person i mean i mean whatever you want to say about him like writing a book even though he he was illiterate and all that but i mean you could kind you could basically say that yeah he was a real person mm-hmm. he, he left a definite mark fingerprint with yeah lands that he conquered yeah he left an empire uh unlike jesus you know there's no definite proof that he existed mohammed's could be a conqueror and a plagiarist yeah well and and plagiarism and and the the use of plagiarism by religious figures is pretty common and well documented yeah Uh, going back to to ellen white again uh she was a rampant plagiarist right uh there are entire chapters in some of her books that she lifted entirely from history texts (laughs) she later in her life actually when you know had money uh had 
editors working with her to help make sure she didn't do that and that the citations were all good. But yeah, it's it's not unheard of for prophets to plagiarize. If there's if you find words that sound good and you're the 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 mouthpiece of God, then well, might as well make that be from you. And this uh, story segues nicely into politics and religion, but mm-hmm. even though that was a short science segment, we will take another quick break, and then we'll be back with politics and religion. All right. As a listener of the show, I'm going to assume you love my sexy vocal stylings. If you love the rest of the show as much as my voice, consider giving us the resources we desperately need to purchase quality cocaine and Red Bull. We make it super easy to make a one-time donation or to support us on a per episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at AtheistNomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. A dollar an episode is all we ask. Kim Davis, the Rowan County clerk in Kentucky, decided to stop issuing marriage licenses after the Supreme Court ruling in June. Hmm. Her rationale is that all licenses issued in her county requires her signature, and signing a marriage license for a same-sex couple is granting her approval of it and goes against her religious beliefs. Right. By not issuing any marriage licenses, she isn't discriminating against same-sex couples, and it's not a big deal since people can just go to another county where they can get licenses in a half hour or less. Well, eight people who were denied licenses disagreed, and they sued in federal court where she was ordered to start issuing licenses, but District Judge David Bunning allowed a temporary stay so she could ask for a longer one from the higher from a higher court. Okay. Both the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court have turned her down. Hmm. The Sixth Circuit's reason is they didn't think the case had any merit. Ouch. The Supreme Court didn't go into details, but they didn't have to. It wasn't up for any kind of appeal with them, and they just issued that ruling in June. <laughs> per the temporary stay, she had to start issuing the licenses on the day of recording, uh, yeah. September 1, and she refused. And this was caught on camera. And many cameras. <laughs> many, many cameras, yes. Every time this, this lovely couple goes in to get their license, even more cameras show up. Uh-huh. <laughs> And after 17 years together, she needs to just do her fucking job and give them a goddamn license. All right. Uh, but you know, because she refused, uh, two couples filed with Judge Bunning, <laughs> and he has summoned her and her staff to court for a contempt hearing on Thursday, the day, the day of, of release. release. So, yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> Watch Facebook and Twitter. We will have more on this. And, you know, generally I try to stick to, like when I post articles, I, I try to just do a quick description um, without really weighing in. And I might exercise a little more liberty with this one. <laughs> uh, so uh, Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash atheist nomads will be the place to get that. And also there's more links than I have in the show notes on this story um, because it's just been developing so fast. Um, check out the the Facebook page or Twitter for for more. And Twitter, it's uh, we're at Atheist Nomads. Uh, now, there, so there are some kinks in this. Uh, you know, a lot of people. I've seen a lot of people ever since this started uh, asking. You know, can't we just fire her? And unfortunately, no. She's actually an elected official. Mm-hmm. And Kentucky. Uh, they're they're they've already kind of said that you know oh we don't really support this but there's like not a chance in hell that she would get uh fired that she would get let go to get fired you you can't fire an elected official no but you can impeach an elected official thank you proper term um and different states have different ways uh, other options on how to, to remove officials Uh, Kentucky does have a law that allows for misdemeanor charges to be brought against civil servants elected or not for not doing their job. Hmm. And the district attorney in her County has declined to bring charges citing a conflict of interest. And 
referred it to the state attorney general, who is considering a run for governor. So again, not a chance in hell. He might appoint a special prosecutor Eh. who would probably be the district attorney from one of the neighboring counties. Uh, But yeah, this could bring a year in jail. More likely is contempt of court. That's what I'm more hoping for is that the judge will put her in jail for contempt of court. She has, she issued a statement today saying that she will not resign her position, which would be one way to get out of this and that she will not start issuing marriage licenses, right? Which would be the other way out. Well, I'm, I'm hoping the third way out is judge puts her in jail for a while and then she just can't have her job anymore because she's been in jail. It would speed up her getting removed. Uh, she might not but, even need to be removed at that point. Well, like she uh, would, fed, federal jobs, you know, if we spend time in jail, she's uh, elected again. There's no automatic out for elected officials until the next election. Mm. Worst case scenario, she's kept in, in federal prison through the next election. Ah, fuck it. Do it. <laughs> uh, her staff is also being summoned because they are also refusing to issue marriage licenses. Well, so the well, yeah, deputy clerks. They could, she would fire him, I'm, I'm betting. So this, this could end up resulting in that entire department, all three of them, <laughs> sitting in federal prison. And the county clerks are going to have to appoint somebody to, to fill that spot. Yeah, that'd be tasty. <laughs> but more <laughs> likely than the judge throwing her straight in jail would be levying fines for not doing her job. I'm hoping he doesn't do that because... Yeah, I don't want him to be fined. That wouldn't have any meaning in the day of crowdfunding. Right. They would have a... Well, they're probably going to have a GoFundMe anyways. Oh, I'm sure she has one just to cover her court costs because this is her suing as a private citizen, not as her office. So she can't use county funds for this. <laughs> but, oh man, it's... <laughs> this is this is crazy, and it's still going on. Uh, th- th- I know the governor wants to get her out, but he doesn't have any way to do it. So this will be very interesting to watch. I am, I am, I am eager to see her locked up. Of course, on the flip side, with that, that would just make a martyr of her. <laughs> well, I'd be fine with making a martyr of her too. Fuck it, gun squad. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yes. Uh, moving on, uh, we usually report on Pakistan for people being killed for blasphemy. Yeah. And that's why it's so awesome to be able to say that CFI Pakistan, part of Center for Inquiry Transnational, has been established. This is amazing and scary. Yeah. So far, it only has an online presence and is being led by Emmanuel Enoch, who is using a pseudonym for very obvious reasons. But this is so needed and so dangerous. (laughs) Yeah. And, And if there was any way we could get Emmanuel on the show, I would love to, with his voice distorted, assuming he speaks English. His, her, I don't care. I'm just yeah. glad they're they're like, taking a chance. Well, they do have a picture of three men holding up victory signs and CFI, well, th- flashing the victory sign while holding CFI Pakistan signs. Do you know that picture was taken in Pakistan? I'm assuming so. Yeah. Their faces are blurred out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was probably Pakistan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I've never had to distort anybody's voice. That'd be, that would be interesting. Oh, man. Uh, so, uh, moving back to something a bit closer uh, to, to home for us anyway. Uh, St. Mary's Academy, a all-girls Catholic school in Portland, hired a lesbian last spring to start this school year. And over the course of the summer... A survey about marital status, relationships, and the like was sent out to staff. This prompted Lauren Brown, the then incoming counselor, to ask the principal about whether or not she could bring her girlfriend to school events and what would happen if they got married. In response, the school terminated her employment and offered her one year's salary and benefits as hush money. <laughs> she didn't take it. 
and the media coverage that ensued prompted enough public outcry from such notable figures as the CEO of Columbia Sportswear, who is a major donor, and the mayor of Portland. Oh, I didn't the, know he was the mayor. No, he's not the mayor. Okay. The mayor also was, was condemning it. Okay. Uh, not able to say, you can't do this, but saying, you shouldn't do this in Portland. Or just shouldn't do it, period. And the board has since uh, revised their equal employment policy to include sexual orientation. Unfortunately, they have filled Brown's position, uh, but now hope to be able to reach some kind of reconciliation. Now, this story is pretty routine. Uh, Gays working for Christian schools getting fired is common, especially Catholic schools, where for some reason they think they'll be welcome. Uh, There's two things I find noteworthy here. First is that any gay man or lesbian would even think about working for a Catholic school is completely and utterly asinine. Second is that, oh, do you you disagree? Is it asinine? I mean, it depends on if they're trying to change policy or, or trying to open the eyes of the public in general. And thinking that if you can openly be gay, working for an anti-gay organization that has every legal right to be anti-gay. Sure, but policies aren't going to change without a few people going down. So? I still think it's asinine. If you want to work for a school, work for a school where you'll be welcome. Let let the Catholic schools die the old-fashioned way. Uh, I, but, I, I'd, I'd rather them be outed for the bigots and assholes that they are. So, I mean, if, if if people are trying to do this to make a stand, make a, a statement, then I'm cool with that, too. But she wasn't. And no, that is true. Lauren just wanted to work for that school. She thought that it was a good place for her, a good fit, and she wanted to help make sure that school succeeded in teaching bigotry. Now, anyway, the second thing I find noteworthy here. Hmm. Uh, is that it was their adherence to church dogma that prompted the school to fire Brown. And that is something they have every right to do. Sure. But even the nuns signed off on kowtowing to public opinion and pressure from donors. (laughs) Ridiculing and denigrating religiously motivated bigots works. And if we keep up the pressure and we don't start turning a blind eye to bigotry, we can make this world a much better place in spite of religion. I love the hush money though. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it makes sense that they offered her hush money. They knew this wouldn't end well for them if word yeah. got out. Yeah. Portland is not a place where bigots will do well if it's known that they're bigots. You can go and out 20 miles outside of Portland and that shit changes, but yeah, yeah Portland's yeah quite the liberal haven. Yeah. And so they knew that they would save a lot of money and a lot of hassle by trying to buy her silence. The, the fact that the money coming from what was his name? Tim Boyle from Columbia sportswear, that that was threatened. They probably could have offered her a million dollars to keep quiet and save money. <laughs> and Honestly, they should have offed her if they wanted to keep her quiet. Oh, well, oh you know, wow. It's not like the Catholic Church hasn't killed people before. Yeah, that was when they had political power to burn people at the stake. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know. Always time for one of those uh, good old, old-fashioned ti- old-timey revivals, you know. I don't know. <laughs> Bring back the Inquisition. Sure. The Inquisition. Let's begin. Uh, <laughs> and uh, moving on to our final story. Uh, mm. By now, everyone is probably sick of hearing about the Ad- Ashley Madison hack. I'm not. But it's time for us to weigh in uh, b- and need to do so before we actually get to the reason why it's even relevant to the show. Mm. Uh, hacking is a federal and generally a state crime. Adultery is not. I have heard stories of people whose marriages were saved by Ashley Madison, 
either because they got on there and found out how good they had it with their spouse or because they needed an outlet in divorce or an open marriage wasn't an option. There are people who created accounts and never went any further, people in ethical open relationships, and people who cheated, got caught, and already worked through it. Yeah. This hack has resulted in spousal abuse over the rage from finding out about the cheating. It has resulted in several suicides, <laughs> and it has put people in countries like Saudi Arabia at risk of beheading. Fuck. <laughs> people in Saudi Arabia, including gay men, guilty of two capital offenses in that country. Well, I mean, it's not like you're going to find a woman on that site. <laughs> some people have there's only like 12 there's like i don't know some stupid about compared comparatively it's something like 10, 10 to 1 i thought it was way higher than that it could be but i thought there was like i don't know hundreds of thousands of people on there but only like 1200 or 12,000 of them were con confirmed as women it was a stupid small amount yeah but it was enough that some people could find someone to fuck on there. I suppose. Like family values, religious right warrior, and incestuous sexual abuser, Josh Duggar. Oh, yeah. He had two accounts on the site, had numerous affairs, including uncomfortably rough sex with porn star Danica Dillon while his wife was pregnant like with their do. fourth child. And now he's in a treatment facility for supposed sex addiction. Yeah, I, I don't have any pity for him. Not not after family values. Yeah, and that's the, the big thing here. He was harming people. I think so. Uh, not counting his, you know, ignoring his, his wife and sisters that he harmed. Uh, he was harming people with his attacking gay rights and women's rights and reproductive rights hmm. he was not a good person and couldn't even live up to any kind of standard that he pushed well at least everybody he diddled or fondled was a woman he's you know big on shaming people shaming women especially mm-hmm you know, yeah just nasty this guy I don't think he deserves any pity. <laughs> oh, none at all. No. And, you know, we could hope that he could get actual real treatment for being the pathetic excuse for a human being that he is. Instead, he's at a Christian facility where he'll spend 40 hours a week doing community service <laughs> and then going to Bible studies. I'm, I'm sure it'll be in some like elementary school or something. His uh, community service. <laughs> uh, no, uh, he'd be more for the high school students eh, maybe middle school middle yeah middle, yeah maybe, yeah uh, uh, but th this is the same kind of bullshit not treatment that he got for assaulting his sisters well all he did then was get uh time at his his family's uh friend's construction business yeah yeah cops didn't do a goddamn thing just took a report god damn it manual labor is not therapy no Therapy is therapy. Yeah, with an actual licensed counselor. <laughs> Even if he had a Christian counselor, somebody who framed actual scientific principles in the light of Christian theology and belief and lifestyle and all that bullshit, it would be better than Bible study and community service. It's not a DUI. He has no self-control. And, okay, that whole sex addiction thing, it's, it's not even a, in the, the, the diagnostic manuals. It's not something you can diagnose. There's no diagnosing criteria for it. It's not a real thing. But there's definitely underlying issues here. He has, if nothing else, serious boundary issues. Oh, and I'd like probably to, a lot worse. I'd like to add for all the guys out there that are considering Ashley Madison, don't. And he actually met Danica Dillon in a uh, gold club, whatever. I'm not sure more, strip more details about that. It's a strip club. Okay. Strip club that she was also, she, she's a porn star and a stripper, and she was working that night. 
and apparently he's been a big fan of her for a long time but uh he paid her 1500 bucks um was really rough with her didn't use protection and was all about uh uh well being really abusive in his in his yeah. uh, speech towards a lady yeah just ew. that's all kinds of wrong I mean, it's cool if it's agreed upon, but eh, eh, man. the fact that she was uncomfortable with it definitely suggests at least that angle wasn't consensual. <laughs> you know, if, if you're going to have rough sex, that's fine. As long as everybody's in, gre- in agreement on having rough sex. <laughs> he actually uh, approached her a second time later with an apology uh, he said something to the, uh, something along the lines of, I'm sorry, I was not in my right mind. That's what you do in movies. So I figured it'd be okay with you. Motherfucker. Yeah. yeah. In movies when it's all discussed and agreed uh, upon and planned out. Uh, ew. This guy thinks that, you know, acting like you do in a movie is just normal and that's what you should do. Yeah. I mean, oh, and. He actually blames the whole thing on porn. Sure. All of it. Right. That the real problem is he was a porn addict. That's why he had to have affairs. And that must be why he did it with his little sisters. Nasty fuck. Uh, that's, that's such bullshit. Yeah, no. Homeboy's got issues. Uh, the rest of his family's got issues too, but... Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, this has like further discredited the Duggar family a family that needs seriously discredited. God damn. (laughs) One of the sisters that was trying to, well, one of the sisters that uh, got abused by him was going to be a speaker at at an event not too long from now, but uh, they basically took her off the list after a whole bunch of uh, people canceled saying that they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to go to that convention. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Ah, all right, we're going uh, a bit long, so uh, let's go ahead and move on to feedback. Talk about feedback. Todd Mills at In God We Trusted at Atheist Nomads. I got petrified wood. Huh, LOL. Thanks, man. Appreciate I it. I came so close to giving you crap for that, <laughs> but we were already going way off and a bit long for the, the beginning. How could I not? I mean, I'm I'm a 12-year-old at heart. Come on. Yeah, is it uh, that old, Uh, Wesley? uh, All old and and dried up. At 12, yeah, 12, yeah. I could see that, yeah. Dick and fart jokes, man. That's what makes me laugh. But petrified wood, that's like... (laughs) That's like what Pat Robertson would have. Assuming Uh, he can. No, Pat Robertson would be like a limp spaghetti noodle. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so you're Uh, just thinking about petrified as hard as a rock... I'm thinking along the lines of old and dried up. No. Okay. (laughs) Anyways. And from CC Takato, that's at CC Takato, at Atheist Nomads, obviously carbon dating is a lie from the pit of hell sarcasm. That was in, uh, (laughs) that was regarding the uh, Quran carbon dating story. Uh, thought that was that was pretty good had to share that one anyway you can always email us at contact at atheistnomads.com you can call us at 541-203-0666 tweet us at atheist nomads or hit us up on facebook facebook.com slash atheist nomads do we get new patrons no okay oh i Any- still have those i put them in the template god damn <laughs> i'll fix that okay <laughs> yeah and we have no new patrons yet again. Uh, we're still sitting at 52. Oh, no. I'm thinking maybe we need to... Uh, $52, not patrons. That's $52 oh, the God. first episode of the month. <laughs> and that's including oh, that's averaging funny. out the, the uh, PayPal money. Oh, uh, no. we're, we're, we're stalled <laughs> here. The goal had been to be to 100 by 100, and now we're at 110 episodes. All right, so here's the deal. If you like what you hear, you know, give us a little scratch. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, you know, go to Patreon, give us one one time donations over PayPal, or 
you know, buy some sex toys over at Amazon and use our click through on the on the atheistnomads.com website and, you know, it'll give us a couple bucks and you'll never see a difference. But you'll be doing some good. Yeah. Yeah. Aww. Help keep us going. Yeah. Fucking, you know, cocaine ain't cheap. Come on. <laughs> uh, my student loan isn't cheap. Student loans aren't cheap. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. I'll be paying for that goddamn theology degree for a long time. Yeah, but it it's came in so handy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Anyway, listeners, we will be back at you next week with an interview. Yay. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.